I could spend probably more than half an hour explaining who Jeff Hearn is, but with, we're very short of time. So as probably most of you know, I will just say that he's a professor in three different countries, in three different subjects. He works for Oberbro University, for the University of Huddersfield at the UK, um, for the Hanken School of Economics, Finland, and for Nordic Menengage. We are very pleased to have with us Professor Hearn to talk to us about moving men, changing men, other men. Thank you. Okay. Right. Hello. Hello. I'm going to stand. If that's all right. Can you hear me? That's the first important thing. Yes. Good. Um, well, let me first of all say, well, this, yeah, as you say, this is the last session, right? So, <laughs> and I'm sure you're all feeling <laughs> very lively and, <laughs> and exhausted at the same time. Um, anyway, um, I should explain just about um, one thing here, is that these three th things here are universities. Pro Feministi Miehet is an activist organization in Finland, and then Nordic Men Engage actually is a new association of Men Engage, which actually was formed last Friday <laughs> um, of the Nordic countries. Uh, let me just continue by saying the obvious. The, saying the obvious is often very important. I want to thank um, Begonia Equish. <laughs> English, okay. Um, Christian Nardini and Paco Abril, and many others, I'm sure, but for organizing this uh, really amazing event. Uh, it's been very inspiring and very exciting for me to be here. And um, before coming here, I prepared various things to say. But actually, of course, over the last couple of days, it's got more complicated because different people have said things that relate closely to what I might say, and so on. So, and when I give these kind of talks, I really hate <laughs> sitting down and sort of reading what I'm going to say. I get bored, basically. I get easily bored with myself. So I'm just going to talk about some of these things using some of the overheads. I also always have too many overheads. I'm just going to go through some things that I think are in my mind or my body, if you like, as well. OK, um, as I understand it, when the conference was organized, this was one of the things that was emphasized in terms of moving away from oppositional thinking towards emerging models of masculinities and so on. So not just only a negative critique, if that's appropriate, but also towards what you might call positive transformation. That's what's been discussed. Although I do think the relation of the two things, the critique and the transformation, is very, very important. And they're not really separate, at least in my understanding. And one of the things, actually, I found a real challenge preparing for this, thinking about this, and not knowing what the sessions would actually be talking about, is that you had these three themes, politics, uh, care. I put relationality with a question mark, and I put not violence, if that makes sense, and media representation. And this is an unusual combination, I think. I mean, deliberately, you're nodding. <laughs> OK. And, um, I often go to conferences that are actually on two areas, which are not here. I mean, one actually is violence, which has been raised from the floor, and also by some of the people on the panels. And I, in a way, I guess one could say care and violence are sort of opposites, but not always, actually. And the other area that is often on the agenda is work of various kinds, which again, of course, relates to care. <laughs> care is also work, but care also may contrast with work and so on. And the other thing that struck me about this, thinking about it first of all, is that you know politics is everything. <laughs> politics is you know all the time in this room, and in a sense, representation is everything. You know, I'm speaking, and that's representation. And I thought, for, well, is care everything, or is there always is there always a dimension of care going on? I'm not sure. Um, men and masculinities. Um, this may be 
awkward, but I mean, f for various reasons, I've actually been for a long time much more interested in the notion or the concept or whatever of men, the masculinities. And I'm interested in men both as subjects, like doing things, and as objects, like things being done too, observed, studied, changed, and so on. And I see men as a social category, you know? It's socially produced, it's gendered, it's also intersectionally gendered. It's not essentialized, that's very important. And this isn't noticed so much still within mainstream politics and in mainstream academia and research and elsewhere. Incredible, I just think, you know, some of my academic colleagues are stupid, okay? All right. <laughs> You could be a professor of management and not notice that you've got to study men, okay? It's really stupid. Um, starting with politics, I mean, I think it was, Kritzia, in, in your session, you introduced the notion, or re reintroduced the notion that the personal is political. It's a very powerful notion, I think. I think going back to it, it's from the 60s or probably even earlier. But for a long time, I've thought about it should be the personal is political is theoretical. So when we're discussing issues, and a good example is violence, I think, although that's not the center of this conference particularly, it's a personal issue, it's political, it's also very theoretical. Just saying the word, if you understand. But also I think the personal is political, is <laughs> the personal is work, is, is political, is theoretical. Doing these things is work. I even started wondering, well, maybe is care, should, maybe one should add to this list, you know, the personal is work, is care, is political, is theoretical. One could go on, make it more complex. And these things tend to occur in different sites or contexts. Like, there's a tendency to say, you know, the theoretical, the theoretical is in universities or research, and the political is in, you know, political organizations. But actually, these things are happening all the time in all the different places. And I'm trying to speak personally, it says, without recentering men. That's what it says here on the overhead. I'm trying to do. The three things that I'm trying to keep, I've got a lot of triangles here, <laughs> just as a way of trying to look at things visually as well. This is representation. One is to keep this explicit focus on men and masculinities, which is what this conference is about. Another one is this personal, is political, is theoretical, and the third one is what I would call deconstructing the dominant. It's a notion that I think is quite helpful to think about othering, applying the othering to the dominant. So I'm trying to keep these together somehow when talking. It's very difficult. Um, in terms of politics, I mean, there are many, many, many kinds of politics. Personal politics, activist politics, what I would call policy politics, theoretical politics, and many other kinds of politics. We could list them. All right? In terms of politics and feminism, I mean, I, I think the notion of the man question or the men question in feminism has a long, long history, going back certainly for a few hundred years and probably much longer. The question is what to do with men, how to actually understand change. It's been on the agenda of feminisms in the plural, not just one feminism, but feminisms. I quite like these two quotes. They're from the 80s, you know, a long while ago. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I can be uh, frivolous when speaking. I apologize. <laughs> um, this is from Amanda Sebastian. I see men as my political enemies. I don't want to kill them. That's too conservative a solution. I want them to stop being men anymore. And then um, Alice Jardine, we do not want you, that means men probably, to mimic us, that means women probably, or feminists. What we want, I would say, what we need is your work. It's very Lutheran, I live in Finland, but, <laughs> but I mean, work can mean many things. You know, it means not, not just, dare I say, pissing about. I'll come back to pissing about later. Um, it means doing something, you know, whether it's working as a researcher or whether as an activist or, yeah, childcare and so on. It means doing something. Okay, that's a picture of a man, okay? I'll come back to this. This discussion, I think, is also very important. I mean, I started myself, the first activism or men's group I was involved in was 1978. So that I can tell my story, I'm not going to, because it would take a while. 
was 1978. That was a men's group, a kind of a so-called CR consciousness raising group, so-called. And I'm sure all of you have your own stories about how you came interested in these things. But actually, just as a sort of diversion, I can also tell a different story that I became interested in gender or sex or sexuality when I was five or six, actually. I went to a primary school, which, which was mixed, girls and boys. My best friends actually were three girls, Mavis, Judith, and Gillian. And then at the age of seven, we went to separate schools. That was totally normal in those days, right? So, I mean, this took me a long time to realize, actually, that from five or six, I was actually quite interested in gender or sex or sexuality. It didn't occur to me at the time because that, in those days, in the 50s, you went to a single-sex school in Britain when you were seven in my locality. Anyway, going back to this here, I mean, in terms of public writing, I mean, these are two quotes, one from Ray Wing Connell, who's been mentioned a lot. Reasons for men, particularly heterosexual men, to move from defense of patriarchy. There are good reasons. You know, this was written in 1987, or published in 87. Things are always written a couple of years earlier when they're published in, pra in, in practice. I won't read them out, but you can see some of the points. And then actually in the same year, sort of separately, I wrote in another book, some material reasons for men to change against patriarchy. Possibilities of love, emotional support and care for and from men privilege emotional development from work with children and so on, ending with trying to avoid nuclear annihilation. And I would add to this list now, sustain, uh, surviving in the planet, which wasn't on the list then, okay? The planet and sustainability and the environment now seems much more obvious than it did in the 80s. Again, this was talked about in the first day when one starts talking about men and politics, or men's politics, or men's movements, or men's activism, to say the obvious, you know, men are, men are doing politics all, all the time without calling it that. There are men's movements in political parties and trade unions and so on throughout the world. But in terms of these kind of what we would call gender conscious activity or movements, there is obviously a huge range. And this does create some pretty important tensions or just downright conflicts. I mean, perhaps most obviously contrasting anti-sexist, pro-feminist, um, some LGBTQ, queer, transgender with men's rights organizations. I mean, there are some big differences going on out here, out there, in here, maybe, which are very important to recognize, I think. This is a diagram, another triangle. You know, triangles are quite nice, you know. I've, I've used blue ones, just for... <laughs> and uh, this, I'm sure some of you know this. This is from Mike, Michael Mesner from California, writing about the US some while ago. We've used it with uh, a colleague, Lynn Egbre -Holmg Holmgren in Sweden, and adapted it a bit. And it's talking about why should men bother to get involved or interested in gender, gender politics, feminism, gender equality, etc., right? LGBT, etc., and so on. One is the sort of gender justice model, the top of the, top of the peak, <laughs> top of the mountain. One is more focusing on difference, you know, black men, young men, bisexual men, whatever, emphasizing difference as the motivation. And the third one is the costs of masculinity, so-called. And um, each of these motivations, I think, is worth recognizing. And the only thing I'd say is that taken to an extreme, if you like, or only focusing on one can lead to some strange politics. If one is only interested in the costs of masculinity, nothing else, you know, couldn't care less about the privilege or the justice issue, that could be very, very dangerous indeed. I think it's a very important issue within the men's health arena, actually, which is probably one of the most buoyant, expansive areas internationally, which hasn't really come up very much, actually, in this conference, in fact. The men's health area is the big area in terms of money, publications. There are at least three journals on that alone, academic journals, internationally. So taking to an extreme in different directions, you know, these 
poles, these apexes, cause some complications, particularly the costs one. It's all mentioned already, Men Engage. I think Men Engage is a really interesting organization, and I think at least Yen, what's your second name, Renard, what's your, oh, that's good, yeah. And I'm sure others know about, our, and Shay, uh, unknown name, yeah, are involved, and I'm sure others are. I've only just been last Friday, I say, to this Nordic meeting, but the point about Men Engage, I think, is that it has mainly group members. It's not just individuals. It's like groups, associations, networks, NGOs. It includes national networks of networks, if you like, and mainly in the Global South. The term Global South is not perfect, <laughs> actually, but it will do, just as a shorthand, I hope. And there was this very big event in Delhi, New Delhi, with over 1,200 people, and you can see the rest. 94 countries and so on and so forth. This is really quite big, and I find it hard to imagine this happening 20 years ago. That's what I would say. And they produced a very interesting declaration. Is this okay? This, yeah, okay. It's produ they produced a very interesting declaration from Delhi. I didn't go, but others did, which I think you can find online very easily just by searching Delhi declaration. It's really worth looking at. It's about three pages long with about 10 or 15 points, it's very concise, and the point about it, it's looking globally, not just only in one's local sphere. This is very important, I think. Okay, this is a complication. In fact, I'll go back to this. this, this triangle. If one focuses still on the top of the triangle, you know, and to be a bit frivolous again, uh, the good, the good men, the good pro-feminist men, <laughs> inverted commas. And think about the top of the triangle. There are still some big differences amongst, I say, even, well, I'll call out pro-feminist men. That makes sense, right? And I'm using here a framework from Judith Lauber, a very expert US feminist, where she talks about three versions of feminism, talking very broadly, this is very broad brush. One is what she calls reform feminism, which it basically is, you know, aiming for gender balance. It's a, it's a kind of gender equality model, you know? There should, be, you know? there should be fair sharing of care and jobs, division of labor, you know? Great. Who can disagree with that? The second is resistance feminism, which is basically critiquing patriarchy, the system, the whole caboodle, the whole thing, right? And the third, and the third one is so-called rebellious feminism, or pro-feminism, if you like, which is critiquing gender categories, you know? And this is obviously influenced by queer theory and other kinds of deconstructive approach. So it's not just about equality, it's not just about the patriarchal system, it's actually about categories. Straight, gay, women, men, I won't go on, but there are many, categor many categories. So you can ask, you know, as a pro-feminist or a feminist, where do you fit on this? And there are some disagreements, okay? Even amongst those who fight for ge gender justice. Theoretical politics. There's a lot I could say here, but time is limited. I like to use the term, I don't like the term masculinity studies, actually. In fact, I don't like the term masculinity, actually. But anyway, I, I like the term critical studies on men and masculinities. It's been a growth area, to my surprise, over the last 30 years or so. Um, there's still a tendency, I would say, to focus on what I would call a personalization or interpersonalization of gender and men. It's very, I mean, <laughs> it's very powerful, as has been talked about, and it's very important personally, individually, for me, and I'm sure many of you, but that's not the only thing going on around gender and men. And there's been the so-called ethnographic studies, many, many studies, and there's been some engagement with men and masculinities 
and globalization. What is going on in the world? Hegel masculinity has been discussed by Claire Duncanson and others already. It's become a very dominant framework. It's been also incredibly strongly critiqued as well, but it keeps going. And there are growing influences from the global, from post-colonialism, sexuality, body studies, STS, science, technology studies, and so on, and so on. Things are getting more and more mixed and mixed up. And of course, there's the whole question, just like now, of Anglophone language domination. So many Anglo scholars don't know about what's going on in the world in non-Anglo languages. And many of them don't care. I'm so rude, actually, aren't they? They, they, they don't. <laughs> anyway, the area has grown a lot. There are research projects, there are publications, there are at least 15 international journals, amazingly, it's a lot. There are book series. And from my point of view, one should emphasize, you can't see it here, one should go for historical, cultural, relational, materialist, anti-essentialist, de-reifying, naming and deconstructing studies. That's what I kind of like. But there are still big tensions here. Um, I mean, one is around power and what I've called, and others have called, dispensability. You know, you know, in one sense, men have power, okay? Individually, structurally. But there's also another very important narrative, which is around the dispensability of some men, and also, of course, women and children, but just focusing on men for the moment, which is really sees its form in various places, health-wise, in war, um, in imprisonments, and so on and so forth. Dispensability of men, I think, is actually an important element to bring in. And I've said already, there's a sort of a, a double issue about what has been called naming men as men, but also problematizing men as well at the same time, and going beyond the binaries. Um, and again, to say the obvious, and it's come up already around intersectionality, men are not only men, <laughs> and boys are not only boys. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll leave it at that. And masculinity is still, to me, a tricky term, right? Because it's used in all sorts of ways, and it's happened in this conference. It means practices, configurations of practices, identities, types. It means institutions, processes, even psychodynamics. So you can be talking about, you can be using the word, the same word, but actually be talking about different things. And that happens a lot, I think. Another picture of another man. Okay. Care, care, care. Um, as I said at the beginning, well, two things. One was that I was a bit surprised by the combination of, of uh, elements, you know, politics, care, and representation on media. But I think this has been one of the strengths of this, this conference, actually, to surprise people a bit and have some different kinds of discussions and disagreements. And as I said also, just to repeat, to me, it's kind of obvious that politics and representation apply to everything. But care is a bit more unclear, I think. And I mean, care, of course, can also mean different things, ranging from you know, doing care to caring about somebody or loving somebody. We haven't discussed love much, much actually, in fact. Uh, love's a really important question, I think, for, for men to look at. And of course also I say that the, the, the word care also operates differently in different languages as well. So, I mean, as has been said in the last session and yesterday as well, I mean, care is a very powerful sort of motif to actually gather political momentum around. It, it, it's really powerful and it can be very appealing um, very emotionally appealing, in fact, and very p emotionally powerful for individual men. And is also, of course, as it says here, of course, it's, you know, one of the, the central issues, you could say, of, let's call it second wave feminism, you know, the unpaid, reproductive, invisible labor, as against the other kinds of labor. I mean, it's been part of... The, 
those analyses for a long, long time. So it's a really obvious structural question to bring into the room. Um, and then there's the question of how that's been translated. And there's been talk already about leave and, I mean, the thing about leave, parental leave, paternity leave, and the various things discussed partly in the last session and other sessions is that, I mean, usually they're talking about quite small issues in terms of a number of days, you know, 10 days, 16 days. Not in all countries, in Nordic countries, the debate is a bit different. But, I mean, changing care arrangements is, ob again, it's not to be pessimistic particularly, but it's obviously a lot more than changing 16 days. I mean, it's a whole transformation of the relations of care and work and, and so on. And then the question of father politics, again, that came up in the last session, in terms of, you know, whether the way forward is to highlight father politics. And I think there are some risks there, which, because there are very different father politics to go back to these triangles and to go back to the, yeah, the cost of masculinity argument and the relationship with father's rights and men's rights and so on. So father politics is a very contested er area. This isn't about individual fathers, it's about how father politics figures within gender politics or sexual politics more generally. And of course, I mean, not all men are fathers and, or want to be fathers or should be fathers and so on. Um, but I just have here also the term caring masculinities here. And it's a real shame that Ellie Scambor couldn't be here. So I'm just going to say a little bit about, if that's all right, uh, Ellie Scambor from Austria um, was one of the key uh, editors, actually, and authors of the study which, hold on, let me just see. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, which is called The Study on the Role of Men in Gender Equality. For those that don't know, this, I think, is essential reading, right? The Study on the Role of Men in Gender Equality. I'll come back to it in a minute. Which was an EU-funded study over two years. And we had a great, it was a great team of people, or a great team, <laughs> a sporting team. A great collection of people worked for two years looking at men and gender equality in all European countries, almost anyway. And um, it's online, it's about 284 pages, I think. It's quite long, but it's a really useful reference thing to look at. It's a book online, basically. But it was a really difficult study to do, not because of the, of the people involved in the, in the work, but I gather this is being recorded, so I've got to choose my words very carefully now. But the funders of the study were the European Commission, and I'll just say that we had to educate them, okay? And we had to educate them. That's, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> anyway, this, this study looked at men and gender equality in terms of policy, policy issues, policy politics. And we, we used, I mean, as a kind of motif, the notion of caring masculinities. It's not perfect, <laughs> but it's a way of just opening up some policy debates. And of course, when one says caring masculinities, immediately the thought is, you know, childcare, fathers. But of course, <laughs> it also relates to other kinds of care. Care for older people, care for those with disabilities, care for yourself, care for your men friends or lovers or whatever. Um, it also means caring masculinities at work. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, neoliberalism and the pressures going on within the paid economy and what that means. But, you know, caring masculinities really challenges that, actually, or confronts that or some of those neoliberal tendencies, care at work. Just as another complication, I don't know whether this, you can see this, but this, there, okay? Um, at a very, very general European level, one of the things one can sort of say is that men with more education may tend to do a bit more care, care work, okay, as a generalization, but men with more income tend to do a bit less. <laughs> Okay, that's sort of 
interesting in itself, I think. Men with young children tend to work often the longest hours. <laughs> Men, as they get older, may tend to do less care work, as came up in one of the sessions. So there's some very contradictory things going on here at a very general, least European level. Okay? And then at the bottom of the page, it says care and, sorry about this, care and violence. It's, it's just me. I'm just confused. <laughs> Good, yeah. Care and violence. I was, sorry, yeah. I just want to raise that because the politics of care or caring masculinities or the politics of fatherhood cannot be separated from the politics of violence because, you know, some fathers are violent and so on and so forth. Um, so, I mean, and somebody can be care, caring and be violent. I mean, both in actually doing the care and maybe on yesterday and tomorrow, but not today. I mean, there are all sorts of... And, even, and of course, love comes into this. You know, you, you may love the person who is being violent or whatever. So, I mean, I think putting together care and love and violence is a very, very tricky thing, but it's worth doing. Okay, this is just one diagram from the report I mentioned, and you can't see it, but I mean, all it basically makes the point is that the care work done in terms of unpaid weekly work it's increasing generally in most countries by men, but it also varies fantastically. I mean, I won't read out the countries. It varies fantastically with, it was Greece at the lower end and Sweden and Denmark and Finland at the top end. So, I mean, this is kind of just to make the point, we're not all talking about the same thing or the same situation. Oh, okay. Um, In terms of the, the policy politics around men and masculinities, I do think there's been a strong tendency to focus on family, health, even interpersonal violence, sometimes emotions, sexuality, care, um, without necessarily foregrounding bodies. That may, may seem strange. I mean, I think the, there's still a reluctance to actually really talk about bodies and what that means. So there's a tendency, I think, in policy politics, as I call it, to frame these issues around what I called here uh, a welfareism, a kind of we you know a social policy model, a welfare model, which is you know, which is good, but it's not the whole story. Um, and just again, to make, I think it's, well, in, what's going on? This links to Men Engage again and, what, and other things. What's going on is that these kind of questions are now being taken up in many, many parts of the world. And, I, and I'm already I know there are big links between here and, say, Latin America and, and so on. This is, and this is just referring to the Images Study, International Men and Gender Equality Survey, which is being conducted in several countries, but including countries outside Europe, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and so on, and looking at attitudes of men to gender equality, and how, at a very general level, issues like men's own education, mother's education, interestingly, men's reports of to what extent their father was involved in, let's call it care as a shorthand, uh, the background of mother only or joint decision making parents and not witnessing violence to the mother. I mean, these kinds of, let's call them factors, it's not a good word, but I'll use it, tend at a very general level to go along with more gender equality attitudes. And then certain of those attitudes tend to be more predictors of more gender equality practices, what men actually do, right? In terms of, again, domestic participation, childcare, less violence, and more likely to be satisfied with the primary relationship. I mean, this is kind of, I think, very important sort of global stuff. I'm now gonna mention actually another researcher, Oyston Gulvag Holter, some of you probably know him. I've known him a long time. He's been working on 
these kind of issues at a global level, not looking at individuals as the images survey did, but looking at sort of macro data. And this actually is from the um, US. Actually, I'll, I'll leave this perhaps. Um, no, I won't, no, I won't. He, he's looking at basically how in different macro data in US states and different countries of the world, one can look at things like to what extent there's gender equality and to what extent there is a sense of well-being as reported. I mean, you can criticize the notion of well-being. It's a very slippery concept, you know. But this is comparing states with high gender equality on the right and states with low gender equality on the left. I mean, it, but if you're interested in this, he's written an article. I'm going to leave this. He's written an article in the journal Men, Mas Men and Masculinities, published last year, 2014, which is quite a long article, where he looks at this and explains this. And he talks about more gender equality, <laughs> you know, less depression, more happiness. I mean, this is, this is important things to sort of put, to say the obvious. Less death by others' violence, and some suicide, less divorce, more, which may not be a good thing sometimes, more sharing of care. And he actually argues rather mischievously that actually men have more to gain from gender equality in the short term than women. Right? This might sound weird or count, counterintuitive, but that's what he's arguing. Maybe he ar argues too strongly, but that's an, an argument worth taking seriously. Another man. Okay, what is neglected? Still, there's a neglect of bodies, aging. Men at the top is are neglected. That's why I say there's a turn to welfareism. Do you understand? As a kind of, to get to the men at the top is a much different question. Transnational institutions and processes, information technology is still neglected, I think, a lot as an issue, despite yesterday. And my obsession for the last, I don't know how long, 20 years, has been transnational issues. So this becomes my, my advert. I've just got a book out. That's the flyer. <laughs> That's the book. It's called Men of the World. It's a, it's a clever title. No, right? But anyway, it's, and it talks about different transnational arenas. When you start thinking about these issues transnationally, there are so many questions. It's a bit worrying. <laughs> There are so many questions. These are some of them. There's militarism questions, of course, transnational corporations, big business, global finance, international sports, you know, sex trade, bio movements, migration, refugees, religious movements, technology, the environment, knowledge production itself, academia. I mean, you can go on and on and on. There are huge challenges, putting it mildly, to look at men and masculinities in these transnational areas, and this is not yet being done enough, in my opinion. Yeah, militarism, I mean, Claire Duncanson gave a great presentation, and this is just um, something I remembered that military spending, this is 2002, just came to my mind, 20 times the development aid globally. The figures haven't changed much, actually. I checked them just recently. In 2002, the increase in US military spending was about the total poverty aid from the rich to poor countries. Militarism is a huge part of the picture, which, okay. The global economy, again, I mean, you know all this perhaps, but I st I mean, how does this relate to men and masculinities? I don't think it's good enough to say that men and masculinities operate in a context of just global politics, global politics itself is framed in these ways. So, you know, the world's, wor the world's wealth is distributed in these kinds of ways. Half the world's wealth owned by 1% of the population. The bottom half, the same as 85 richest people in the world. The financial sector has mushroomed hugely, so it's the sector exceeds about 12 times the world's GDP. There's something really weird going on here. Right? Foreign exchange is actually done mainly for speculation, not for trade. And increasingly, this is also being done by algorithm, algorithms, you know, virtual algorithms, not by even people actually you know, trading on the floor. So 
this is going on somehow behind the, sorry, no, no. <laughs> this is going on and really does set a huge context. And to examine these things in terms of men and masculinity is, is a huge challenge. Okay, these are two books. One is the one here. Another one was published two years ago with Marina Blagojevic from Serbia and Catherine, Catherine Harrison, who's now in Denmark, I think. Okay, that's the book. Representation, how long have I got? Okay, oh, that's all right. <clears throat> okay, maybe I was r running on too fast. Yeah, okay. Okay, I want to talk about representation a little bit. And as I said earlier, <clears throat> um, representation to me is something that's going on all the time. And I don't sort of have a model that there is this thing and then it's represented. <laughs> you know, rep the representing actually makes the thing. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't think there are separate objects that then represented. The representing is happening all the time. And um, to jump to the bottom here, actually I do think there's a tendency when one says representation or even media or even mass media to then think, oh, this is visuals, this is pictures. And of course, well, yeah, maybe not of course, partly through internet and online technologies, etc. there probably has been a move to visual representation historically um, at an increased rate, probably. Um, but visuals are not the only form of representation. And but visuals are, uh, well, how can I put it? They appear to be very appealing, <laughs> right? I mean, you can show nice pictures, and you know, I've shown a few pictures in passing, which I'll come back to. They appear to be appealing. <clears throat> but representation is much more than that. It, I mean, writing is representation. So those of us or you who are writers or researchers or are writing speeches, politicians, or writing policy documents, or <clears throat> whatever, are doing representation of, your, say, your activism. <clears throat> and uh, speaking is representation as well. So, and I don't know how, my speaking is going on now <laughs> for you. But I mean, at the beginning, I was trying to, with these funny triangles, and just to make the point that the person is political is theoretical, and politics and representation and care are in a relationship, and the focus on men and masculinity and deconstructing the dominant are all, they're going on at the same time. But how do you speak that, right? Okay. I'm going to show a few pictures because, <laughs> despite what I said, pictures are appealing. This is one. Actually, I'm going to tell a little bit now about. I, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm in. A, uh, it's actually an organization called Pro Feminist Mia, which means Pro Feminist Men. We're not very active currently, and I'm pretty fed up about it actually in Finland, but that, that's the reality. But the organization was formed. I think in 1999, I think that's correct. It was formed actually because uh, the White Ribbon Campaign, which I'm sure all of you know, came to Finland <laughs> via Michael Kaufman from Canada. And there was a meeting, and that was great, and there were about 12 or whatever men there. And then the campaign, White Ribbon Campaign started. Um, and this is just one picture from one demonstration of two hands. But then, if any of you have seen the film Life of Brian, I don't know if you have, M Monty Python, there they have the breakaway from the, <laughs> the Palestine Liberation Front, Liberation Front, whatever. Anyway, there was a breakaway from the White Ribbon Campaign because some of us were very, very dissatisfied with the way in which the White Ribbon Campaign was being conducted in Finland. <laughs> 
partly because it was psychologizing violence. It used a, it used a slogan, uh, I think, a violent man is an anxious man, or something like that. Um, and it also argued that uh, we shouldn't focus on violence against women, we should focus on violence against children. So, for various reasons, some of us broke away from that <laughs> and formed pro-feminist men. Anyway, so this is just a picture of one demonstration. Representing books is also another big issue. This is a cover of a book on violence. How do you produce a appropriate representation for a book cover or a campaign, an anti-violence campaign? The picture actually is from a F Finnish artist. It's called The Truth-Telling Tree. Okay, it's, it's not a picture of violence. This is from a Swedish photographer called Annika Bjurstrom, who I think lives in London. I've never met her. She's, if you go online, she has some very interesting images, mainly of women, actually, but a few of men, <clears throat> or maybe androgynous. And then there's age. <clears throat> I'm very interested in age. <laughs> have been for the last 20 years, and many populations are aging, particularly in some parts of Europe, and the, the sort of taking for granted images online in advertising, as was said yesterday, tend to be certain kinds of bodies, certain kinds of men, younger men, men of middle years, and so on. Pictures of aging men or older men are not so common. Sometimes when I show this picture, people laugh. I, I'm not sure why, but sometimes it brings a laugh. Not today. Maybe that's, pr that's progress, maybe. No, s seriously, it's a kind of And aging, I think, is going to be an increasingly important issue around what might be meant by masculinity or masculinities, or what might be meant by being a man, and so on. Is it about increasing medica medicalization of men and men's bodies or masculinity? Is it about changing experience, totally changing experience? you know, at 85 or 95? Is it about structures? Is it about continuing, a continuation of power into old age or a real challenge to that power? I've been involved for the last 13 years in a, it's not a project, it's actually, it's a memory work group of older men. Those of you who know Frieger Howard's Frieger Haug's classic work and, and colleagues work in Germany called Female Sexualization. She and colleagues, women, women feminist colleagues, had a memory work group on how women, or how girls become women, how women become sexualized. We decided about 15 years ago to start a group of men writing about what it means to be gendered as men and to get older, to age. So that's what we've been writing about, right, for these years. David Jackson's one of the members. He's just publishing a book called Exploring Aging Masculinities, The Body, Sexuality, and Social Lives. He's interviewed eight men about 70 plus five times. It's, my, it's a very, very de detailed, complicated, different kind of way of writing to what you'd read about in most books on men masculinities. In our memory work group, we've gone through all sorts of topics. We started with, write about a time when you were conscious of your age. It's quite a powerful topic. The second topic we dealt, looked at, wrote about, was, men, was hair. Hair is an incredibly powerful, emotional, important topic to do memory work on. I recommend it very strongly. We then looked at sex, violence, work, politics, peeing, sisters. Okay, this is two quotes. Have I got time? Good, okay. 
This is two, this is two extracts from writing about peeing. Yesterday we, talk, we were talking about anuses, now we're on to peeing, okay. Pe <laughs> peeing is in the present. I am the same person, boy, man, when I'm peeing. So my main memory is from last week. I was working hard, accomplishing, trying to do that is lots of things. I noticed I wanted and needed to pee a lot. At one point, once again, about after half an hour, it is, the, is it the adrenaline? that produces more pee. It wasn't just that, but the pee seemed to be seeping, so much so that my underpants were a little soggy. And then I realized that a part of the front of my jeans, when only a bit damp, was actually smelly. Or at least I could smell it. I feared that other people would immediately be passing by and smelling me, perhaps even crouching down deliberately. That evening, I washed just that patch of my jeans and left them to dry overnight. The next morning, the jeans were dry. I was back to normal no more seeping. And then another one, this is, these are from different people, different men, writers. I used to pee with the force of a geezer, or so it seemed to me. I wanted to put out smoking log fires in the woods. I used to love aiming directly into the glowing embers of a boiling, with a boiling hiss. In that mossy, stinky cavern, the boys' urinals at primary school, I would marvel at my looping arc of piss reaching up and darkening the dry green spaces at the top of the urinal wall. Today, things are different. <laughs> the varied and inconsistent life of my penis is much closer to me. Now my pee flow is jerky, hiccupy, interrupted, particularly when I'm, I'm cold in some anxious, tensed up state. Often I have to wait in the toilet, co coaxing my flow to start, but sometimes it doesn't want to come. So I have to wait until a few dribbles begin. Then getting up steam, a fuller flow emerges, then stops. So I wait, start again, look up, look down, waggle a few more dribbles and pee in the end of my penis. Then I rip some toilet tissue from the, off the holder and wipe the wet tip of my penis. I think I'm going to stop that. Okay. Anyway, this is a different kind of writing to what you actually read in many kinds of books on men and masculinities. Right, this is the last bit. Yes? No problem. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get through. Is it? You think so? Okay. The things I want to finish off with were just well, two things, really. One is just to say, in the light of all this stuff, what do I see now as some key concerns? And then I'll say something about the abolition of men, right? This might sound very weird, but I think it's a, a topic worth raising. One is to just return to this notion about the dual task to name and deconstruct men and masculines at the same time. To sort of name in the obvious way, but also to subvert, take apart, deconstruct. Another, particularly in academic work, is to somehow try and cross the boundary between what I would call material or materialist analysis and discursive analysis, to try and work both materially and discursively at the same time. This is very difficult, I think, but one has to try and do this. Another theoretical issue is not just in English to talk about sex and gender, but also talk about gender stroke sex. This is a, a term that people like Nina Luca are using, and in English I quite like the term jex as a non-equivalence between males, masculinity, and men. They are not all the same thing. Hegemonic masculinity is such a popular term, but is used in so many totally different ways. I think it's useful, but it's not the only aspect of hegemony. If one's interested in hegemony, which is what is most taken for granted, then I think there's an issue about the hegemony of men. How is the category of men formed hegemonically? Right? That's really not problematized very much. Intersectionalities is fundamental. Transnational relations are fundamental, transnational patriarchies. And then finally, what I would call towards the abolition of men as a category of social power. And this idea, again, it might seem weird, as I said, but it's about thinking about what is the kind of gender future that you envisage, or I envisage. Um, it's going back to that top of the triangle from Judith Lauber. Is it about a gender equality model? Is it about a stopping patriarchal model? 
is it about a problematizing of gender categories model? Okay, these are three different possibilities. Um, you know, the move beyond the two-sex model, the queering of men, the notion of multiple gender ideologies, particularly if you look, at, look in different parts of the world. Aging, I think, also problematizes certain kinds of notions of gender as well. The long-term transnational processes of change, some aspects of uh, technology and information technology also, I think, complicate gender, including online. And what kind of future actually is being envisaged in feminist and pro-feminist activity? So that's one thing that now I'm kind of interested in. And this, I mean, these things are being discussed in all sorts of different forums, academically, politically, personally, and so on. And there were some examples yesterday in one of the panels. I won't go through all these. Um, gender queer, undoing gender, John Stoltenberg's work, gender ambiguity, gender pluralism, female masculinity, male femininity, and so on. There are many, many possibilities here. And uh, I think I'm gonna finish just with this, I think. This is something I found online, totally by chance. It's by someone called Sky Palace. I don't know whether this is a person or institution or a group. I don't know whether it's Sky as their first name and Palace their second name. But this person or thing or group write about abolition. And they write, our vision of liberation assumes not equality between genders, sexualities and races, but the abolition of these identity categories as structural relations that organize human activity and social life. We believe these identities are the names of real material processes of capitalism. They say capitalism, I think maybe it's more than that. Not of something essential or salvageable within us. And I'll finish on that. I'm just coming back to this triangle and the attempt to try and connect these three realms that you and your conference have put on the table together. Thank you. <laughs>